This week on The Gadget Show. In our latest challenge, Jason and I become cabbies for the day to find out if in-car sat-nav is actually any good. And John tests compact digital cameras by becoming a photojournalist. He attends a film premiere, visits a stunt show and tries his hand at a bit of glamour work. Ooh, that's a good look. Lucky beggar. Welcome to The Gadget Show and this week we want to start by being a little bit more serious than usual talking about gadgety electronic shops, you know like Curry's Comet and PC World. For a long time now I think it's fair to say that the staff that work in these big superstores have had a bit of a reputation for not being very knowledgeable. Yeah, basically people think that they're rubbish and they don't know what they're talking about. In fact in a re recent uh, study the big computer retailers were slammed in a report by the Office of Fair Trading which found that customers complained about quality and objectivity of the information given by retail sales staff. The point is that the big stores are very well aware of the reputation of their staff and have recently spent quite a lot of time telling us that things have actually improved. So are the staff in these superstores still as bad as we think or is it more a case of a bad reputation being hard to lose? Well, we thought that we would find out for ourselves so we conducted an exclusive Gadget Show survey. We secretly visited 51 of the biggest consumer electronic superstores in Britain, concentrating on PC World, Curry's and Comet, who between them account for a massive chunk of electronics retail sales in the UK. Our researcher Tim was armed with a series of questions designed to see whether the sales staff really knew their stuff. This is Tim, uh, he was our undercover agent. Um, so 51 shops, how long did that take? About two weeks full time. OK, so quite a, a good sample, I think. Yes. And the first question that Tim asked was, is it possible to get high-definition TV over the internet? The correct answer is no. Obviously, if you live in the UK, you can get high-def TV via Sky or TeleWest. And also, interestingly, if you've got an LCD computer monitor, uh, it is capable of showing HD content, but currently no-one is streaming high-def TV over the net. The question is, did our shop assistants know that? It's hard to get the, the sources really because they're not broadcasting over the net. Oh, uh, they're so, not? So you just need to find the sources from the right places. Oh, uh, okay. Well, at PC World, we got the right answer 78% of the time, and nobody tried to blag us. So I think there are plans for that to happen, but uh, the only way you can really get that at the minute is through Sky and Cable. Comet shop assistants got it right 94% of the time, although one of their assistants did say he thought computer monitors wouldn't have the right connections. And finally, Curry's. You can't actually receive anything off the internet apart from small clippings. No one's streaming the television oh, right. in this way at the moment. Curry's did worst on this question, but more than half of their staff still got the question right, although three of their sales staff did tell us that high-definition internet broadcasting was up and running. So, some pretty good answers. Um, overall, 75% of the sales assistants that we asked got the answer to our first question right. Next, we wanted to find out about their knowledge of new products, so we asked them about the new iPod Nano, launched recently by Apple in a huge blaze of publicity. We wanted to know whether they were aware that the battery life was 24 hours, double that of the previous Nano. Battery life on the new Nanos has got uh, up to 24 hours. This time, Comet staff got the question right in every store we visited. Get 24 hours now. In Curry's, they did pretty damn well, getting the answer right 82% of the time. This time, it was PC World who fared the worst. Over 20 hours. 20 hours? Over 20 oh, hours. Over 20 hours. Only 54% of their staff knew the correct battery life of an iPod Nano. Finally, we decided to up the ante with a very technical question, and to be honest, one that we didn't think many of them would know the answer to. So we went to stores selling digital SLR cameras, and we asked whether a wide-angled lens from a film SLR camera would work just the same on a similar digital camera. Uh, the answer is actually no. The wide angle in this situation wouldn't be as wide as you need it to be. Now, obviously, you'd expect a specialist camera shop to know the answer, but a big electrical superstore, we felt sure that they wouldn't have a clue. But again, we were surprised. Better for you to actually use the same lens that's designed for that camera. Right. Right. When you buy a Canon digital camera, yeah. it can fit onto the same, same body, but it's a different ratio, so it won't, be, it won't get exactly the same for wide angle. Okay. But my advice would be to buy a compatible lens with your new digital SLR. The fact was that over a third of the staff we asked got the question right. 
And, encouragingly, another third readily admitted their lack of knowledge. And rather than making stuff up, advised us to bring our lens into the shop and try it, or visit a specialist camera shop. All of which was a lot more helpful than being misled into buying something completely unsuitable. So, some surprising results there. It does seem that contrary to popular belief, and indeed I think to our original perception of this, yeah. uh, that a lot of assistants do know what they're talking about. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Although I, I must say, I reckon that a lot of people watching the show right now, uh, you're going to be thinking, I don't agree with that, my experience is to the contrary. But don't worry, as always, we're going to give you an opportunity to have your voice heard. We need you to go to our website and tell us not just about your opinion, or right, a conjecture, but specific examples of either real really knowledgeable sales staff or really ignorant sales staff. Really good experiences, really bad ones, let us know. www.5.tv forward slash gadget show. Time for a short break now, but still to come. Jason and I hit the road as cabbies to test sat nav, and John hits the red carpet to test digital cameras. So, sat navs or should I say, in-car satellite navigation devices. Well, in recent years, the sales for these has gone through the roof. Apparently, we spend £300 million a year on satellite navigation devices in this country alone. Unsurprisingly, on this show, we rather like sat-navs. They are gadgets, after all, and I personally think that they take the sting out of any car journey. But being a balanced, responsible show, we thought it was about time we did some serious testing to discover whether sat-navs are an improvement on the old-school method of a glove box full of maps and asking the way. So, later on, Jason and I will be going head-to-head -head in our snappily named sat-nav versus maps and asking taxi driving challenge to find out which is best. But in the meantime, we wanted to find out which is the best sat-nav on the market. So after hundreds of miles of testing, plenty of U-turns and a fair bit of swearing, we chose our favourite three to take on some more serious testing. The TomTom Tom Go 910, the latest and apparently best device yet from the market leader's Go range. The Garmin Nuvi 660. Garmin may play second fiddle to TomTom Tom over here in Blighty, but in the States, this is the number one seller. And finally, the Navman N40i, which may be an outside bet, but this device does have some pedigree, coming from one of the world's leading producers of maritime navigation equipment. So, on to our testing for our three finalists. Armed with the Gadget Show's three favourite sat-navs, our gadgeteers met up one morning last week. In the silver car was Catherine and the Tom Tom. In the black car, there was Bethany and the Navman. And in the red car was Charlotte with the Garmin. Right, Gadgeteers, first of all, I want to find out how long it takes for your devices to power up and locate where you are. So when I say go, switch on. When you complete the task, beep your horn. Ready? Three, two, one. Go! When you switch on a sat-nav, the first thing it must do is pinpoint where it is, i.e. your location. It does this by connecting to a number of satellites and triangulating its position. Let's have a look! <laughs> you go, you go, look. Yes, yes, perfect, well done, OK. The TomTom -tom was by far the fastest, taking just 22 seconds to locate itself. Next came the Navman, and third was the Garmin. That's one for the TomTom. -tom. OK, on to the next test. Next, I want to find out how easy the devices are to operate. So I'm going to give you a place name and I want you to put that in. As soon as you've plotted the route, beep your horns. OK, ready? Cock bridge. We found the Garmin's operating system the hardest to use. But worse than that, cock bridge wasn't even stored on its maps. Whereas the TomTom -tom and Navman both managed to find the location, and, by the way, we didn't make Cockbridge up. It can be found on the River Don in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. But it was the Navman that found it the quickest. <laughs> yes! OK, OK, let's have a look. Got to go. Bridge. Perfect. Yes, well done. Right, so that's one to the Navman, one to the Tom Tom, and nothing to the Garmin, which means that the Garmin is now eliminated. On to round two, which is a drive-off. <laughs> Ladies, you will be driving to Coventry City Football Club. Start your engines. Remember, K 
Catherine and the Tom Tom are in the silver car, Bethany and the Navman are in the black one. You ready, ladies? In three, two, one, go! Time for a cup of tea, then. The sat-navs chose different routes out of Birmingham city centre, but both ended up on the A45. Anyone that knows that road will be aware that it's chock full of speed, sorry, safety cameras. Catherine and Bethany had both been told that if they broke the speed limit, they'd automatically lose the challenge. And they were aided by the TomTom -tom and Navman's camera alerts, which beeped to warn them every time they passed a camera. The TomTom -tom gives road names, whereas the Navman just says turn left or right. And when you're trying to navigate on such small screens, this extra information can make all the difference to stop you overshooting turns. It certainly made the difference in our race. As the girls entered Coventry, Catherine had a small lead. OK, go, 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 go! Catherine and her Tom Tom were first to reach their destination, but she got a bit of a shock. Where... where am I? This is... this is not the stadium! The Tom Tom had directed her to the old Coventry city ground that hasn't been used in over a year. She thought she'd lost, but then a few minutes later, Bethany and the Navman turned up as well. Not a good result for either sat-nav, as both claim their databases are renewed annually. That's really bad. I can't believe that these two, that the manufacturers assured us were up to date, oh, no. couldn't find a, a ground that's been defunct for how long? I know, well, Coventry City started playing at the No Football Ground last season, and um, this, this one was knocked down in March Soccer or May, Soccer aren't they? Yes, thank you very much. You can probably tell you all the scores there for last year. No, but let's move on, because we did another test yeah. coming back to the Gadget Show office, and TomTom -tom did win that. So, overall, TomTom -tom wins. OK, let's get down to the nitty-gritty, the G rating. OK. The Garmin, first of all. All right. I liked the size of the screen, but I didn't find it very intuitive, so I'm giving it two Gs. OK, Navman. Navman, I really liked the shortcut buttons, and I used them quite a lot, and this is the cheapest of the three, which I thought was very good value for money. Three Gs. OK, I think that's fair. Finally, Tom Tom. Four Gs for the Tom Tom, Ooh. because it found everything the quickest, really, really simple to use, and, well, just found it most reliable. It's got a feel-good factor. Feel-good factor. Tom Tom. It wins. <laughs> This is a great little present idea for the ecologically minded amongst you. It's a hydrogen fuel cell toy car. It's powered purely by the sun's rays and tap water. So here's the solar energy panel that converts the sun's energy into electricity and feeds it into this tank that you've filled with water from the tap. There's a chemical reaction and the result is hydrogen, which is fed down this pipe and then stored in this little rubber reservoir inside the car. You can see it through the uh, transparent top of the car there. When you want to drive the car, hydrogen is pushed out of the little reservoir into one end of this fuel cell, which you can see underneath the car. In the other end comes oxygen from the air, and then those two combine, thanks to an array of materials inside the fuel cell, to produce water. As they combine, electrons are released, which produces electricity. And you can't quite see it. If I turn it over, you'll see that electricity powers the motor on that axle there. Look at that! It's really quite quick. There you go, 100% eco-friendly car. You're looking at the power of the future. Now, I want to talk to you about compact digital cameras and Canon's ubiquitous Ixus. Canon likes to think that the Ixus range has iconic status in the gadget world. At a recent Canon event I attended, they promoted it alongside such design classics as the VW Beetle and the Coke bottle. Frankly, I think Canon's getting ideas above its station. There's no way that the Ixus is distinctive enough to be iconic. In fact, you can't even tell one is an Ixus, unless you're close enough to read the writing. One thing that's not in doubt, though, is the success of the Ixus brand. It's the undoubted market leader in Britain, and they've sold 33 million of them since the first one was launched 10 years ago. But is that success deserved? To find out, I decided to test the very latest flagship Ixus against its top rivals from Sony and Fuji. The Ixus 900Ti has no less than 10 megapixels and a titanium body that's supposed to be great to hold thanks to its perpetual curve shape. It also boasts face detection technology, which claims to adjust exposure and focus for the faces in your frame automatically. 
Sony's offering in this market is the DSC-N2. It's more chunky to look at, though no bigger than the Ixus. It also has 10 megapixels and has image stabilization and a nice big touch-controlled LCD. Finally, the Fuji and their brand new F31. This is an upgrade of the highly praised F30, the only major difference being the addition of face detection technology. Though Fuji haven't succumbed to the megapixel race, their sensor is still 6.3 megapixels. To test out the cameras, I'm going on three photo assignments, taking pictures for three imaginary magazines. First, I've come to London to the premiere of Jackass 2 to take the sorts of pictures you'd see in a celebrity gossip magazine. And what better place to test out how easy the cameras are to use than here in the thick of the press pen? Laura? First up, the Fuji, which proved really quick and responsive. Perfect for point-and-shoot photography. I didn't have to worry about turning the flash on and off as the camera did it all for me. Which meant that my pictures of BAM were great. No faffing around here. Thank you. The Sony was a bit slower than the Fuji in the hustle and bustle of the press pen. And annoyingly, the LCD touchscreen didn't always react, so I missed some of the action. Another major problem was the gloominess of the photographs. I did manage to take a brighter one, using the flash generated by the other photographers. The Canon was the slowest of the three, and a lot of the shots were out of focus. Apparently, this is a bloke from Celebrity Love Island, apparently, looking in the wrong direction by the time my camera went off. <laughs> it just takes so long to respond, people have actually turned away in the second it takes to think about it and bounces flat and God knows what. It's hopeless. However, I did manage to get some half-decent pictures of Johnny Knoxville and co, but only because they stood long enough for me to hold the shutter down and hope. So after an evening battling with the professionals for pictures, the Fuji was definitely the easiest to use. My next assignment was for an imaginary bike mag at the motorcycle show at the NEC in Birmingham. Compact cameras often can't cope very well with fast-moving action. So let's see how these cope with the speed and excitement of the Thunderdome arena. Shooting the stunt show was doubly difficult because it was so dark in the arena. With small lenses and weak flashes, compacts have never been that great in low light. But all our cameras claim to reduce this problem with new-fangled high-sensitivity settings. We shall see. Again, the cannon was slow and missed a lot of the action. The autofocus and flash struggled in the low light and the pictures were dark. And when I increased the sensitivity settings, I ended up with lots of noise in the picture. The Sony wasn't much better. Trying to get action in these gloomy conditions with this Sony is hopeless. When you put it on the high sensitivity setting, the flash won't fire because it won't let you use it. And on auto, with the flash, the flash is just too weedy to light anything up. <laughs> Dark. And the shutter lag was so bad that I had to press the button right at the start of the ramp to catch the bike in mid-air, which worked just the once. In these hard conditions, only the Fuji came close to capturing the action like a proper SLR camera would do. It was better equipped to deal with the Thunderdome's low light and the shots were the brightest and least blurred. So far, the Fuji has proved itself as the easiest camera to use and the best performer while shooting action in low light. On to my last test. For my final assignment, I'll be concentrating on picture quality. It's a fashion shoot with one of this year's Big Brother finalists, Ashleen. Nearly ready. Ooh. Ooh, that's a good look. <laughs> Ashleen is kindly striking some poses for me while I take photographs mm. with each of the cameras, with and without flash, to test brightness, Ooh. colour, saturation mm. and red eye. What would you normally do? You'd probably do something like... I can like... jump up on there. Oh, yes, brilliant. <laughs> yes, excellent. <laughs> then I'm heading back to the studio with the results to see what Jason and Susie think. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> nice 
to be you. Okay. It's only good. Bye. Great. What, what I've done is I've put three shots from each camera up here on the wall okay. with mystery numbers attached. Okay. And I'd like you to have a good look at them and see which ones you think's best. There's available light and flash shots amongst them, so uh, go ahead. Have oh! Okay. We'll have a look. Okay, thank you. It's a, bit, it's a bit soft there, but that's available light, so I suppose you would expect that little bit inside. So, number two, well, these are... Beautiful. It's like a security camera picture. It's really pixelated It's really and dark. not very good, is it? Very soft. If that was my camera, I really wouldn't be happy with any of those shots. Um, number three. <laughs> OK, well, these are, these are better than number two. Terrible red eye on that. Mm. So, have you reached a verdict? Yeah, I Definitely. think we'd have. Yeah. We'll start with the worst. Yeah. We think he's number two by a long stretch because they're dark, flat, there's no focus, red eye, everything you don't want in a compact camera. We don't like that one. I wouldn't disagree with that. The surprise is that number two is the would-be icon, <gasps> the Canon. No. Mm. Mm. What was your next place? Uh, second place, we put number three. Better pictures than number two, but still the balance of exposure we didn't think was quite right, and you'd still got that red eye. A um, little bit soft mm. in areas. Mm, but better. But definitely. better, yeah. That was the Sony. So our favourite was indeed number one. Which is obviously... The Fuji. Mm. And that's, I mean, what do you like about it? Well, I, 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 like, I like the fact that I mean, there are two pictures there that, that you wouldn't actually double, double take at if they're in someone's portfolio. I mean, this one here looks like a kind of standard shot, yeah. doesn't it? Which, for a, a camera that's a couple hundred quid, is extremely good. So the Fuji came out top in all three challenges, which absolutely. I guess yeah. makes it our digital compact camera of choice. Yeah, absolutely. OK, what about the G ratings, then? Can we start with the Canon first? Yep, and that has to be two Gs. It's unresponsive to use, the pictures don't look very good, it often doesn't focus correctly, and even when it does, they look a bit blurred, I think. OK, two Gs for the Canon. What about the Sony? Well, that's a good deal better. Three Gs. You get... Um, it can produce really quite good shots, although the balance of exposure, I think, is often, often a bit iffy, but it's much better than the Canon. And finally, the winner, the Fuji? It's not perfect. Four Gs. But, um, but it's still a very, very good camera. <laughs> Every week on The Critical List, we look at a particular area of gadgetry, and this week we're looking at mountain bikes. And if you don't mind, chaps, I'd like to go first. OK, I've got the white E5 Race, which comes out in January, and this baby is the daddy in its field. It's for serious, serious cross-country bikers. £23, really, really light. It's got a carbon fibre rear end. And one of its unique selling points is the suspension. It's got five inches of travel, or give, if you like, which is obviously great for taking the impact. But a lot of serious riders don't like that because on the flat, it's still bouncing around. But this suspension is intelligent, and it doesn't do that as much as other bikes. And it's been designed by John White, hence the name of the bike itself. And he knows his stuff because he used to design the suspensions for Michael Schumacher before he moved to Ferrari. This isn't bad looking, for what it is, an electric mountain bike. Uh, this is your little throttle, it's also uh, a charge indicator. Next to it is one of the, uh, the new range of one thumb shift Shimano gear levers. Um, here's where the, the real technology comes into play though. The battery itself uses a patented side loading mechanism. Did you see that? Did you like that? <laughs> I'll just put it back in there. Weighs about four kilograms, which again is light for a battery. More impressive still though, is how you power it. You can use the throttle, but I, I prefer to use the pedals. Look, can you see if I push here, there's a little bit of give, yeah? That's the torque and speed sensitive sensor. Picking up on my input and then telling the motor, which is in the hub at the back here, how much power to apply. So if I'm going up a hill, I'm obviously pressing hard on the pedals, I get more power. Isn't that cool? I've got a Hummer and it's a folding mountain bike that actually looks quite rugged. In fact, I think it could be the coolest looking folding bike in the world. It's, I mean, this is no little fold up thing with tiny wheels for the city, is it? This is a fully fledged mountain machine. Absolutely. And it's very similar in design to one used by American paratroopers. The idea is they can jump out the plane with it on their back and have it assembled and ready to go with three clips, wow. and it takes about 30 oh. seconds. It should obviously also be very handy if you wanted to put it in the boot of the car. The best thing about it, though, I think, is that it's got no thermal or acoustic radar signature. <laughs> so you stand a fair chance of not being spotted by the enemy, or indeed the neighbours. Time for another break now, but still to come, Jason and I go head to head as cabbies in our Sat Nav Challenge. <laughs> Now it's time to return to the subject of satellite navigation. 
Earlier, we chose our favourite sat-nav, and it was this, the Tom Tom Go 910, but its ultimate challenge was still ahead. Is this little baby with its satellite communication, range of extensive maps and chocolate voice directions actually any better than this? A book of maps. That's it. A tried and tested form of communication. So we went to a local taxi company to become cabbies for the day and I was only allowed to use my sat-nav to get around the city. And I was allowed basically everything else, but maps and kind of rolling down the window and shouting at pedestrians for directions. Outside the taxi company at 9am prompt, we both received our first jobs. Then we had to find the pickup point. For me, it was a simple and quick search through my A to Z for the location, while Susie faffed around for ages with her Tom Tom. Oh no, I've got so excited I've put kings in a bit. King. Are you waiting for a cab? Oh, brilliant. Do you want to jump in? Uh, so, are you aware of where you're going? Cannon Hill Park. Fantastic. That was no problem. It was on my map. Whilst Jason was well on his way, I was just leaving the depot. And to make matters worse, I wasn't seeing eye to eye with my Tom Tom. What's interesting is that the Tom Tom is telling me to make a U turn at these traffic lights, but I can clearly see that there's a sign there saying no U turns. So I'm quite surprised that it's, that it's asking me to do that. I would have thought that it would have known that that's not allowed. So I'm obviously not going to make an illegal manoeuvre, so I'm going to turn right and then it's going to have to recalculate my route. I think that's After the only thing I can do. yards, make a U-turn. Yeah, got you then the first time, Trish. Stay in the right lane. I think I'd like a man's voice. Sharp left, A38, Bristol Street. Then, stay in the right lane. My tom-tom got me to my passenger, but then I encountered problems again. Let's hop in. OK, it's Carver Street, isn't it? Uh, uh, now, I'm a little bit confused about this. So I put in 100, that's the number that she wants to go to. Now, it says there's, there's no matches found for it. It's given me a different... So, I don't know why it won't give me 100, but we'll soon find out. We shall set on our merry way. Meanwhile, I was having a great time. It was still early morning and I dropped off my first job and had a new one to do. It was a pickup at Birmingham Children's Hospital. I had no idea where that was, so I thought I'd ask a cabbie. Although, not myself, clearly. Want to follow me? Yes. How okay. much will it cost me? About five pounds. Sounds very reasonable. Okay. Which way are you going? This way. Which way? Turn back round. I need to turn you round. You need to turn back round. Fantastic! Now, if there's one thing SatNav can't compete with, it's a good cabbie. The ones in Birmingham have to take what's reckoned to be the second hardest knowledge test in the country. The Birmingham Children's Hospital, here we are. Fantastic, picking up Jamie. I don't know where he is. The Tom Tom at least got me to the right street and a bit of looking around found me the number I wanted. Thanks, driver. Yeah, I'm not sure if I like being called driver. With my next job, I hit another problem. I was sent a building name, the Big Peg, and told it was in the jewellery quarter, but my Tom Tom only has major sites in its points of interest, so I couldn't find it. I'm just randomly driving around here looking for somewhere called the Big Peg. I don't know it because I don't know the area that well, and I'm going to be lucky if I find it. Then suddenly, I did get lucky, and I managed to find the destination for my rather nice passenger from the points of interest Hiya. section in my sat nav. So, what do you do for a living, Simon? Uh, I'm a fireman. Oh, fireman. Marvellous. Very nice. I'd been going well all morning and had done six jobs by lunchtime. I was feeling rather jubilant, so I thought it was a good time to ring Susie. Hello. Hello, is that Susie? How are you doing? Have you been cheating like normal? I wouldn't say that, Suze, but improvising, yeah? Yeah, cheating. The TomTom's Bluetooth facility only works with certain phones, and it has had a lot of flack for not being clear enough. But in our conversation, we could hear one another perfectly. You've just made me go wrong because I'm not concentrating. No, I'll, I'll let you go back to your technology, OK? I've got some fares to pick up. Yeah, I think you probably should. Bye. Sorry, did we, did we just not... Were we not just here a minute ago? Yeah, no, you know what, I'm really sorry. Like extra fare or anything, is it? No, no, no. Um, no, don't worry, I'll take it off the fare. Not having a Bluetooth earpiece had meant I'd had to stop for the phone call, and I got further delayed with my next job. You're from France? Vous parlez anglais? No, I'm 
Non, euh, euh, vous... Euh... Je vais à Coffat Co Co Factory. Je vais à Allez, vous allez où euh, Coffat Factory. Excusez-moi Coffat Factory. Le Custard Factory. Oui, bien sûr Custard Factory. I know that actually, I know that really well, but... As for getting there from here, I have not got the faintest. I have to be honest with you, I don't know where I am. I stopped to get some directions, but I still went the wrong way. See you later. Two minutes, madame. Two minutes. La destination. Oh, le factory, le custard. I custard factory in French. Madame. Now I was used to the Tom Tom, I was able to input locations really quickly. Frustratingly, while Susie was on a roll, my afternoon was going badly. Suddenly, I had a set of passengers who didn't know the area, and it was taking me ages to find their locations in my A to Z. You know where Digbert's coach station is? I do. Oh, don't you? No. You've got a taxi, you don't know the coach stations. That's, that is unfortunately the case. Head to the car park here. With just one hour to go, I was trying to get as many jobs in as possible. And I was rushing around as well. Sod the A to Z. I was just going on dead reckoning. Did you order a cab? But suddenly, despite all our efforts, we were stopped in our tracks by the Birmingham rush hour. Oh, look at this traffic. Come on! To help me out, my Tom Tom gave traffic alerts. But to be honest, there weren't a lot of use in the peak time jams. But TomTom Tom are currently working with Vodafone to enable them to give more comprehensive traffic info in the future. Gotcha. Affirmative. Over. <laughs> oh, get back before Jace. Let's go. Ah, yeah. You in the back. I tell you what, love. Um, any chance you could just jump out here? Well, I wanted to go at the bullring. I know, I know, but the bullring is only about a couple of miles that way. Honestly, just, just bear with me on this. One. It's only a couple of miles, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, there's a bus stop just there. It's just I've got this challenge I'm trying to win, you see, and I know it's a bit unconventional. I'm not paying. No, no, but don't don't leave your bag, yeah? That's all right, it's on me. I'm ever... I think she's a bit cheesed off. Bus stop just to the right, yeah? We were now racing to get our taxis back to the depot on time. As I pulled in, there was no sign of Susie. It looked like a victory for old school navigation. What are you doing here? No! Don't forget then, we had to do as many allocated fares as we could within the time. Check um, you out with your allocated fares. That was given to us. Knowledge girl. OK, well, we had to get as many fares as we could in the, in the allocated time. Yeah, we did. So, come on, hit me. What's the score? OK, well, you got nine. Did I? Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, it's great. How much did you get? Ten. Yeah, I knew it. I just knew it this morning when you walked in. You Why? little swagger, a little Perry swagger. And you're with your cabbie mates outside and your little cup of tea. All right, all right, governor. But you still lost. But anyway, look, it doesn't matter who lost between you and me. What matters is the fact that Satnav won because yes. it was more efficient and obviously very easy to use. Got me there a little bit quicker and I think a lot less stressful. Well, watching that film, because obviously I didn't know how you were doing. We had a quick phone call, but I, mm. I didn't see how you were actually doing. And, and I can't pretend that it wasn't stressful for me because it was. <laughs> you know what you need, don't you? What? Satnav.